as I said to you, there are a couple of landfills not too far from here. And um, so what, what happens at landfills? All the garbage that we throw gets deposited. And you know, there are states like Utah and others where they have so much space. You could fill a canyon, it'd take you 200 years, and there'll be no problem. But then you have states like New Jersey, where there's no place to put garbage. And if, even if you found a space, people next to the landfill don't want to see anything near their homes. Because what happens? Property values decline, okay? You smell, and you know, there's all, especially residential waste, it's hard. You know, you've heard when you throw away, you know, see, I, I'm in a family where we're very strong environmentalists, so I hear this all day, you know. And uh, the, so what has happened is, in the past, people used to just dump, and then they used to burn these garbage dumps and leave town. And many years ago, the area, this, these landfills were really under the control of the mob. They ran this, these facilities. And you, you didn't know who, what was buried in these landfills. You hope it was garbage, but you didn't know what was in it, okay? And, um, but then when the Clean Water and Clean Air Act came along, they said, you know what? Not so quick. When you dump garbage, after the landfill closes for 30 years, you have the responsibility to maintain this landfill. Now just think about 30 years. The landfill is closed. Where are we gonna get money to maintain this landfill? So New Jersey and many states have this law that when you run a landfill facility, you need to deposit money into an escrow account to take care of that landfill for 30 years. That's what this topic talks about. It's called post-closure care of landfills. What does it involve? You know, when, uh, when garbage disintegrates, it emits methane gas. And methane gas is not a good thing in the atmosphere. So you need to capture it. So there are these gas collection systems. There's water, when rainwater falls onto the landfill, it comes out on the other end, and that's called leachate, which is pretty bad stuff. So that needs to be treated. So when you add up all of this, I'll give you an example, and this is the accounting equation, very simply. If you hired an engineer and asked him to estimate the cost of closing 30 years post-closure, and the person came to you and said, it's gonna cost you $10 million over 30 years. your capacity in your landfill was 20 million tons. That's the capacity of your landfill. How much money should you put aside for each ton of garbage? Your capacity is 20 million tons. You need to spend $10 million. What should you put aside for every ton? No, the other way around. Because it's 10 million divided by 20 million tons, which is what? 50 cents a ton. So basically what this says is that at the end of the year, you calculate how many tons did I put in there? Okay, I put in a million tons. 50 cents a ton, that means how much do I have to deposit into the account? $500,000. Yeah. The what? Yes, the minimum has to, and it's a good point because that estimate can change from year to year. And if the estimate changes, then you'd have to put more into the fund. Well, you two do, see, the thing is you have to justify it within the rates. You just can't put any money. You, it has to match. It's called asset liability model where you have to match your future obligations. To, but you're right. You should put more than 50 cents. Yes, you should put more than 50 cents because each year the estimate has to be revised and costs go up, and there might be things which might be wrong. And, you know, and that's the problem is that many places just put 50 cents a ton. 
and never go up. It could be a dollar, it could be two dollars a couple of years from there. So, yeah. So that's what this post-closure is all about. And this, these are the recognition rules that I just spoke to you about. So you should be able to calculate. And by the way, what's the journal entry when you put the money aside? So let's say you needed 500,000. Well, you show that basically as a restricted liability, which is called accrued liability for closure, and you deposit it into an escrow account. So you have restricted assets and you have restricted liability. And that's put aside for future use. So that is about enterprise funds and um, internal service funds. So very quickly, once again, what are proprietary funds used for? Business or activities where you want to cover the cost of providing the service. What are the two types of proprietary funds? What basis of accounting do they use? Do you record long-term assets? Yes. Do you record depreciation? Yes. Uh, which one is internally focused and which one is externally focused? Yes. You now, that's, I, I was hoping nobody would say the other <laughs> way around, right? Okay, what's the most important issue in internal service funds? Okay, let me rephrase that. What, what is unique about internal service fund accounting how do you show that in the government-wide statement, the internal service funds? They are part of the governmental activities and elimination occurs. How about enterprise funds? How do you show them as business type activities, right? Okay. Um, tell me something unique about the balance sheet for proprietary funds. What's their net position split into? Three components, right? Okay. Okay, there is net, net position invested in capital assets in restricted and unrestricted. What, what's, what's the other difference that you find in an enterprise fund? You see a lot of restricted assets and restricted liabilities which have restrictions as to how you can use. What about the operating statement? Always operating are put together and non-operating are set aside, right? Okay. Cash flow statement, how many categories of cash flow? Four. For using the direct method, okay? So those are some of the things that we talked about, uh, the more important areas. Okay, um, let's do, let's see.